Hi, I'm Mike Wang. Welcome to another NAS Ask the Experts. I have a great panel here today. We are here in beautiful, sunny Los Angeles at the 38th NAS annual meeting. Uh, congratulations to Zoe Gogawala, who's just announced the next president. And maybe we can go around uh, this panel and kind of introduce yourselves. We'll start with Chol. Hi, I'm Chol Kim. Uh, I'm a spine surgeon in San Diego, California. I specialize in taking care of adults with mostly disc problems using MIS techniques. And I love the endoscopic technique. And my name is Timothy Wang. Uh, I'm a spine neurosurgeon as well. I completed my training at Duke and my fellowship at the University of Miami. And I'm just starting my practice in Chicago, Illinois. Hi, uh, my name is Meng Huang. I'm a neurosurgeon in Houston at Houston Methodist. And I'm a former disciple of Mike. You, he's eclipsed me already. So I want to start with, you know, the, the topic today is about where endoscopy is and should people be learning this? And are we at like the, the peak of it or the very beginning or the end of it? And I, I'm going to go back in time a little bit uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And I remember running into Chol Kim and Chol was very, you were very active in endoscopy very early, right? In America anyways. And I, I approached you, I said, listen, how do I get started? How do I do this? And you gave me really good advice. Um, where do you think we sit now in terms of the the curve, you know, like Scott's parabola in endoscopy? Is well, it early days? I wouldn't listen to me because 10 years ago, I thought the tipping point was going to happen five years ago. <laughs> and I think there was a NAS meeting where I even said, if it doesn't happen by this date, I'd shave my head. But I conveniently forgot about that promise. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think it's soon, though, because I, I have a distinct sense that this slow ramp up is approaching what I call the tipping point. Because I don't think it's going to just happen in a linear fashion. At some point, we're going to hit a threshold and all of a sudden there's going to be a rapid adoption. And it's young guns like this that's probably going to make it happen. So and you would, old guys like us have to just enjoy it. But you would happens. say like this is something that people really need to understand to some degree because it's coming hot and heavy, right? Like a freight train. Like a freight train. Okay, good, good. Well, that, you know, Chol Kim is always uh, very much looking forward instead of like in the present and backward. And so I, I think that that is a good way to start this because it's an important principle. A lot of folks are on the sidelines, right? A lot of folks are just waiting to figure out like, is this something I want to learn? And is it important? Is it even really a real surgery? So I want to, I want to turn to Meng. And I remember, um, you know, I use endoscopy mainly, as you know, for fusion. But when you started, you were like head first. And, and I mean, I, I can't remember the percentage of cases you were doing endoscopic, but you really like embraced it full bore, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll give you a slightly uh, long winded answer. But, give it. but basically, you know, from the beginning, early on in my residency, we did a lot of MIS. We did a lot of tubular decompressions. But I always thought there's got to be maybe an, another level. And obviously, endoscopy has been around since uh, the 2000s and even you know modern endoscopy has been around since the 2000s and so when you popularized it i was like okay i gotta go there that's where i'm gonna learn endo this is it i have to i have to go see mike and then learn from mike and um so i was uh fortunate to have uh, a position to go back to at methodist where i was already a known entity and i had support from my mentors like paul holman um, who's, who also shared the vision that endoscopy is part of the future. And so for me to come and learn and come uh, and bring it back, that was always the plan. And so I've never had any barriers to that. And that was always the vision. So I've, I've always been, been head first, 100% all the way. And fortunately, because of how things have worked out, this was this was supported the entire way. Yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking back to like Christoph Hofstetter is the only other one, but even he did not do what you did. And I want to think that you did like 40% of your cases starting were endoscopic or something like that, right? Well, I wouldn't say 40, but I think my first year I did somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 endoscopic wow. cases, uh, decompression cases. Um, and at this point in my career, I'm, I'm reaching about 300. And, and you said you didn't face any barriers, and that's unusual and, 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 and actually Very wonderful. Unusual. Very unusual, right? Yes. Did you worry at all about the board's collection period? I mean, I know we're neurosurgeons, Chol's an orthopedic surgeon, but we, we now have this board's collection period just like ortho, right? Um, did, was there any sense that, wow, maybe I shouldn't do this? Or how would you answer that concern, I guess? Yeah, I, I think that that was a risk and a, and a little bit of a, a gamble. but. You know, I've always believed in endoscopy. I've seen the results. I mean, the results speak for themselves. And so to me, 
as long as I could demonstrate uh, to the boards that my outcomes were good. Um, and I also kept all of my intraoperative fluoro shots that showed exactly where I was mm -hmm. so that I could prove to you that I was there, um, that, that I felt like I could justify any case. And interestingly enough, none of my endo cases out of the 40 that I submitted for the boards were picked. Wow. That, you know, that's a very important message to get out there, whether you're pro or against that. You, you're, you're saying that if you do things right with any surgery, you don't have to be worried. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I get asked that question a lot by people uh, during their board collection period um, for both ortho and neuro. And usually I tell them, be very careful <laughs> because there's a lot of bad experiences in our kind of memory banks when this first came out. But you said something really important. If you demonstrate that you properly prepared for your first case um, and you chose, if you took the time to choose the right first case um, and you did really good informed consent and then you keep track of everything, um, even if you have a complication, I don't think that they, the examiner would fault you for that. So mm -hmm. if you're going to do a lot of endoscopic surgery today during your board collection period, um, just copy Meng. Yeah. yeah, and if that they were going to blame brilliant. me for it, I was going to blame it on you. Yeah, so just yeah. blame me. Just blame and me. going to blame it on me. So so it all comes, yes, back comes back to troll. To somebody, yeah. So and I, I put it on Tony. I want to yeah. turn to Timothy Wang now. So, so Dr. Wang, you're just getting started in your practice. Tell us about what goes through your mind as to whether or not this is something that you really want to try to embrace or is it something you're going to wait a little bit on? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that Meng, uh, I think, hit on a lot of salient points because in my training, all of it for early career surgeons was how to be safe and how to, in that boards collection period, hit home runs, slam dunk cases, push off the sort of complex cutting edge stuff to after that boards collection period because you didn't want to be put on the spot with an unproven technology or a proven technology that the board examiner didn't understand. Mm. Um, I think for me, in looking kind of at, the, at the future, a lot of it has to do with the precedent that's already been set by the people ahead of me. So I think neurosurgery is a lot about mentorship. I think spine surgery is a lot about mentorship and seeing what's worked and what hasn't worked and mimicking patterns that you know are going to produce success in the future. So I think you know when I'm first starting and um, adopting this kind of stuff for, for my practice, mimicking a lot of what you've already done and what Meng and other folks who are really, really skilled in, endosco in uh, endoscopic spine surgery have already done, um, is what I'm going to mimic probably first. And then as I think I get more skilled in the, um, in the equipment and better or, and more knowledgeable about indications, I think I'll expand my, my, uh, my techniques and, and the patients I treat. With. Yeah. I mean, that's been fun to watch because folks like Meng uh, over here and Christoph Hofstetter, they certainly are much better. And I really mean this, it's not a pandering endoscopist than I am because I use it mainly for fusion. I'm sorry, you're gonna, you're gonna say something. Oh, I was, I was gonna chime in um, uh, to, to that point. Um, I think Christoph and uh, Peter Derman recently mm -hmm. published um, their learning curve on uh, posterior cervical. And basically one of the salient points was that it's, it takes longer, but it's not unsafe. Mm -hmm. There weren't an increased number of complications compared to what you would expect. So uh, as a new endoscopist, you should understand that as long as you are properly prepared and you're taking your time, you're not necessarily doing something that's unsafe. Mm -hmm. I want to turn now to another potential barrier, which is cost. And um, I mean, Chol, you, you've spoken, written, and lectured about this, and uh, in, I think even published. I mean, if you are starting your practice, or even if you go to a new hospital, most places have the discectomy tools. They might have a microscope and all that. But if you're doing endoscopy, there's the endoscopic towers potentially, there is the disposables. How, how do you work through this in your mind to be um, cost conscious, if you will? Yeah, first of all, endoscopy has suffered all these bad luck scenarios. And despite that, it's still lingering on. And one of them is that the way the culture of the hospital, you know, pur purchasing department seems to work in almost every hospital is that uh, there's capital purchase equipment and then there's disposables. And once somebody purchases something, they figured it doesn't cost anything. And so it's all about the disposables. So when you do a microscectomy, you have no disposables and it's free. <laughs> and then you show up. You're probably the first person to do endoscopic surgery and you want to do the same surgery using equipment that now costs a lot more. So... Um, I don't know exactly how to get around that. Um, that's probably for somebody like you guys that are starting out, that's our job to lay that groundwork. But mm -hmm. until that time, 
I like what you did. And I think the same thing happened to me. It's really great if you have a mentor, especially the chairman of the department, that is going to support you and basically has decided, okay, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to make these young guns do it. Because that's kind of what happened to me. And when you have a strong leader in your kind of organization that supports you, it makes a huge difference. So in retrospect, that's probably the single most important thing that you can do. Yeah. You're not going to be able to find Absolutely. another surgeon to do it with you. Yeah. They're going to wait for you to stumble before they try it. So getting um, yeah, there, like the there department a, chair to help you ahead a, of time. There's a trust in the vision and a trust in the abilities. And then so, you know, I had, I had the tower before I even came back from fellowship. They had already bought it. So I want to close this uh, session by asking each of you in turn about, for folks on the sidelines, what is the most single compelling reason why you should become good at this or learn about it or develop the skill set? So I'll start with you, Meng. What is, the, what is the thing that you would tell anybody that's thinking about this? This is the reason why you need to get engaged. For, um, for endoscopy. For endoscopy. Yeah. Well, there's just so many things that you can do with the scope that you're you know, if you're not familiar with endoscopy, you're, you don't, it's not even a concept in your mind. But if you come to these meetings and you see the talks and you see the cases that are being shown, I think your mind will be blown, honestly. And then, you know, a lot of these cases you can convert from a, a, a definite fusion operation to a non-fusion operation. And that makes a big deal um, in, a, in a patient's life and uh, economically. Yeah. And I think um, for my answer, it goes back to, you know, what you taught me on day one is what would I want for myself? Mm -hmm. And what do you think is right for the patient and that specific indication? And after seeing how well the patients do with endoscopic procedures, I think there's no argument there. Joel? I think you, you nailed it right on the head. There's all different kinds of ways of looking at things. But in the end, the litmus test is what would you do if it was you or your beloved family member? And I can just tell you that if I had a herniated disc or my wife had a herniated disc, it's not even a question. It's not even close. Um, so when you come across a technology like that, um, you're just compelled to kind of pursue that line. It's just human nature. So, um, uh, I don't think it's for everybody, not, you don't, you know, you don't have to become an endoscopic surgeon, but to think that that is not going to be a, a major part of spine care in the next 10 years, um, I think it's a freight train coming and it's going to happen very quickly, like a tipping point. And when that happens, the people that are kind of thinking about and prepared, they'll do well. The people that aren't, they'll either use that to retire, which, um, and just slowly wind down or have to learn it quickly. So, um, uh, I'm a big believer in making sure that we really address things like the learning curve and get people to understand that this is a really important technology because, uh, I'm amazed at how much negativity there was 10 years ago, but I'm equally amazed at how much of um, like an evangelistic atmosphere there is among my younger colleagues. I mean, it's palpable. Great. Some That's a side. great way to wrap this up. I want to thank our panel for being so honest and generous with their time. And also for our listeners, uh, please uh, look at our offerings of the NAS educational platform, whether in person at our national meeting, whether at uh, Spine Across the Sea or Summer Spine. Uh, and please keep watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.